Welcome to chapter three, annotating the SARS-CoV-2 genome. In this chapter, we will discuss how we can decipher the SARS-CoV-2 genome sequence. Up until this point, we have assembled our viral genome, but it's still a bunch of uninterpretable A's, C's, G's, and T's. How can we actually understand the virus from this? For this, we shall explore the concept of genome annotation. But before we even discuss genome annotation, we need to discuss the central dogma of molecular biology, which is the process by which genetic information propagates from one generation to another. The DNA can be thought of as a book that contains all the instructions for creating all proteins of a given organism. It is broken into chapters, which we shall call genes, and each gene contains the instruction for creating a specific protein. As an example, let us imagine we want to build a bicycle. A single gene is transcribed into a special type of RNA called messenger RNA or mRNA for short, which you can think of as essentially being a photocopy of a single chapter in our book. The mRNA contains a copy of the instructions required for creating a specific protein. In our bicycle example, we have photocopied or transcribed the chapter of our DNA instruction book that describes how to build a bicycle. Finally, the RNA is translated into proteins, which is the functional unit of molecular biology. In our bicycle example, we have used the copy of the instructions, or in other words, the RNA, to actually build our bicycle, which is the protein. Of course, as it is with all biology, reality is much more complicated than the simplified summary. But for the purpose of this course, we will only consider the simplified model. As mentioned, DNA is transcribed into RNA, and RNA is translated into proteins. For the purpose of this course, you can think of the DNA sequence as a string over the alphabet A, C, G, and T, and the RNA sequence as a string over the alphabet A, C, G, and U. And the process of transcription is simply replacing all the Ts in the DNA with Us, as shown below. For example, if I wanted to transcribe this DNA sequence here, I would just replace every T with U to get the corresponding RNA sequence. As mentioned, a special type of RNA called mRNA is translated into proteins. Recall that RNA can be thought of as a string over the alphabet A, C, G, and U. Similarly, a protein can be thought of as a string over the alphabet of all amino acid, of which there are around 20 letters. Each triplet of RNA letters or codons encodes for one very specific amino acid, which is summarized in the codon table shown below. Note that translation usually starts with the start codon, AUG, which encodes for the amino acid methionine, or M. And there are three codons which designate when we should stop translation of RNA, also known as stop codons. UGA, UAA, and UAG are typical stop codons. The simplified algorithm behind translation for the purpose of this course is as follows. Start with the start codon early in the RNA sequence, which is not necessarily the first one, and translate each codon one by one until a stop codon is reached. AUG, which stands for methionine, is a common start codon, but many bacteria have various different start codons. For an example, let us say I want to translate this RNA sequence. I would start by translating an early start codon, in this case, AUG, which is encoded for M. This is the first letter in my protein sequence as shown here. Then I take the next triplet, GCU, and translate that, which gives us A. Then I take my next triplet, ACU, and translate that, which gives us T, T, H, I. Then we have GCC, which translate to A, S for AGU. And finally, we reach UGA, UGA is a stop codon, so I stop translation here. So we have successfully translated our RNA sequence into the proteins shown below. So in our previous example, we were looking at an RNA sequence instead of a DNA sequence, and we knew exactly where to begin translation. But if we've just assembled the genome of an unknown organism, all we'll have is the DNA sequence reported by the assembly. Now remember that DNA is double-stranded. So the DNA sequence reported by the assembly is just one of those two strands. Therefore, without any additional knowledge, there are six possible reading frames that we need to consider. 
three in our DNA sequence, starting at nucleotide positions one, two, and three, and three in the reverse complement, also starting at nucleotide positions one, two, and three. Genome annotation tools will consider all six reading frames when predicting what parts of a DNA sequence encode proteins. So here we have an example of a translated open reading frame. And looking at this, two questions come to mind. First, does this open reading frame contain a gene? And second, if so, where is this gene located? We can answer these questions by parsing our open reading frame and looking for substrings that begin with a start codon and end with a stop codon. Then, similar to how we've used BLAST to search nucleotide sequences, we can query our potential protein sequences against massive databases of annotated protein sequences to find identical or highly similar proteins. And we can use these matches to predict properties and or functions of the proteins we found. For our analysis, we will use PROCA as our genome annotation tool of choice. PROCA was developed by Torsten Seaman and leverages numerous bioinformatics tools and probabilistic models trained on previously annotated genomes. You can follow the instructions in our course to learn how to run PROCA on our SARS-CoV-2 assembly. But in this course, we will only use PROCA and not discuss the algorithms it uses under the hood. If you're interested in learning about those algorithms, you can read the related chapters in the textbook, Bioinformatics Algorithms and Active Learning Approach. Now, genome annotation tools like PROCA try to predict features of a genome using probabilistic models. And as the famous quote goes, all models are wrong, but some are useful. And as such, while PROCA's annotation predictions are useful, they are certainly imperfect. Fortunately for us, by the time you are taking this course, Virology researchers have thoroughly curated the SARS-CoV-2 genome, and a high-quality annotation is available for us to compare against. Even in the early stages of the pandemic, PROCA was just one of multiple potential genome annotation tools, and researchers would want to be able to use multiple tools and compare the resulting annotations. For this comparison, we will be using the Integrative Genomics Viewer, or IGV, to visually compare our predicted annotation against the high confidence SARS-CoV-2 genome annotation. Essentially, IGV will let us load multiple annotations and display them in a way that makes them easy to compare directly. IGV also lets us interact with each annotation to look at its details a bit more closely. Now, assuming our predicted genome annotation is accurate, how does it actually help us study this novel coronavirus? It turns out that if we incorporate some existing knowledge from virological research, we can use the predicted annotation to gain some insights into the functional mechanisms behind how SARS-CoV-2 invades our cells, that is, the spike protein. To the left, we see a visualization of a coronavirus, and to the right, we can see a close-up of a specific protein of interest, the spike protein, something our PROCA annotation is able to identify. The spike protein is essential for the virus to enter a cell. It consists of two functional subunits, S1 and S2. S1 forms the globular head that recognizes and binds to specific receptors on the surface of human cells. S2, directly embedded into the viral particle surface, mediates the membrane fusion process. That is, the merging of the viral particle and the cell, eventually allowing the virus to invade. 